is Susan Derwin. I am the director of the Interdisciplinary Humanities Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today to the talk by Anjan Chatterjee, who is the Elliott Professor and Chief of Neurology at Pennsylvania Hospital, and a member of the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience, as well as the Center for Neuroscience and Society at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Chatterjee received his BA from Haverford College, where he graduated with honors in philosophy and is MD from the University of Pennsylvania. After interning at the Medical College of Pennsylvania and doing a residency in neurology at the University of Chicago, he held a number of fellowships and then became a faculty member at the University of Alabama. In 1999, he joined the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania. <coughs> Professor Chatterjee researches in the areas of spatial cognition and language, attention, neuroethics, and neuroesthetics. In his neurological medical practice, his focus is on patients with cognitive disorders. He has published over 125 peer-reviewed papers, and he is co-editor of Neuroethics in Practice, Medicine, Mind, and Society, and The Roots of Cognitive Neuroscience, Behavioral Neurology, and Neuropsychology. Professor Chatterjee was the 2002 recipient of the Norman Geschwind Prize in Behavioral and Cognitive Neurology, awarded by the American Academy of Neurology. And he is past president of the International Association of Empirical Aesthetics and past president of the Behavioral and Cognitive Neurology Society. He's on the editorial boards of numerous journals, including Empirical Studies of the Arts, the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, and the American Journal of Bioethics. His monograph, The Aesthetic Brain, How We Evolve to Desire Beauty and Enjoy, Our, and Enjoy Art, is a neuroscientific inquiry into how and why aesthetic sensibility is a fundamental component of the human mind, and it is the basis for today's talk. The aesthetic brain takes us on a journey through the brain networks that regulate and mediate the perception of and pleasure in viewing aesthetic objects. Drawing from evolutionary psychology to examine why human beings are captivated by beautiful objects. In his book's preface, Professor Chatterjee <coughs> anticipates that his study's conclusion, namely that humans do not have an art instinct, will disappoint defenders of the arts who fear that it will provide justification for the belief that, quote, art is trivial, frivolous, and a luxury born of an indulgent society. Notwithstanding the skepticism Professor Chatterjee anticipates, to my mind at least, his findings felicitously, felicitously provide support for proponents of the arts. For even as the ascetic brain maintains that art is not an instinct, it equally emphasizes the fact that artistic practice has occurred throughout history and across cultures. Art may not itself be instinctual, but its ubiquity suggests that what stands behind it, namely the capacity for imagination and the ability to symbolize may well be inseparable from the social instincts. That is, from the processes and practices that enable human beings to develop into social subjects. We know, for example, that the creation of symbolic forms helps to preserve psychic intactness in the face of extreme anxiety, and that art making aids in the recovery from trauma. These are only a few ways in which the work of the imagination enables human beings to remain connected to themselves and to others. Thus, in reinforcing the idea that aesthetic experience is integral to human life, the aesthetic brain also implicitly affirms the importance of understanding the myriad forms, existential utility, and implications of the aesthetic imagination if we are to grasp what it means to be human. Please join me now in welcoming Professor Chatterjee to speak on the neuroscience of aesthetics and art. Thank you. 
you very much. <coughs> I wish I could take you on the road with me. <laughs> <laughs> so you might wonder uh, why, for a talk on aesthetics, I would start with a picture of such a dour looking man. <laughs> so in, uh, on October 22nd, in 1850, this man, whose name is Gustav Fechner, uh, it is claimed had a certain kind of insight uh, that, that is a prelude to what I'm going to talk about. And over the next 15 or 18 years, he, he had uh, two other main ideas that are completely relevant. So his insight was that the way our brain processes information in the world bears a systematic relationship where properties of the world map onto properties of the brain and that this was lawful and could, could be mapped in mathematical ways. And he came up with what uh, was known as Fechner's Law. But the main point being that to think of the mind or the brain as an independent entity from the world around just didn't make sense. And that one goal of psychophysics, so he's regarded as the, uh, uh, as the, the father of psychophysics, was to establish what these mapping uh, strategies were, what these mapping principles were. The second insight he had was that, uh, uh, and this was more of a speculation, that in the same way that there was this outer psychophysics, which is what he meant by that was properties of the world as they relate to properties of the mind, there was an inner psychophysics uh, that the outer psychophysics had to be mediated through the nervous system and that there were properties of our nervous system that could also be mapped onto properties of our mind. And he recognized at the time that uh, there was, uh, that the tools didn't exist to really start engaging in an inner psychophysics. And so, you know, here we are 150, 165 years later uh, where we do have the tools. And so in some ways, I think part of this talk is a realization of Fechner's fantasy that we might have an inner psychophysics. And then the third principle that he emphasized, uh, that he wrote a book called The Elements of Psychophysics in 1861 and 1876 or 78. Uh, he wrote a book called Primer of Aesthetics, uh, where he, he introduced the notion of what he called an aesthetics from below. And by that he meant that aesthetics was something that could be informed by empirical information as opposed to being argued uh, only on first principles, which is what he suggested was an aesthetics from above. And so he thought if you had an aesthetics from below and an aesthetics from above, then at some point uh, these uh, two enterprises might meet uh, and that there might be a fruitful exchange at that, at that interface. And so in some ways, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is really uh, kind of, uh, uh, I, I would say, is uh, everything Fechner thought about or speculated about is sort of a prologue to the rest of the talk. So a couple of framing slides. Uh, one is uh, to establish the domain of what we're talking about, which is that there, uh, the cognitive neuroscience of aesthetics and the cognitive neuroscience of art overlap but are not identical. The cognitive neuroscience of beauty uh, certainly uh, overlaps with both of them. But it's worth keeping the idea that, that each of these domains uh, are not isomorphic. Just as, as we uh, go on. Uh, and then this is another framing uh, kind of uh, slide, uh, which uh, was a paper I published with Roman Bartanian in Trends in Cognitive Science, uh, which is the general approach as in most scientific enterprises, if you take a complex domain, is how do you break it apart into its elements and start picking apart the elements to try to understand them uh, and build a model of what you think is going on. And hopefully, uh, the hope is that in doing that, you don't violate uh, the, the entire enterprise, that you don't reduce it so much that it no longer has relevance to what you're studying. But at least the, 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 the project is to break it down into its component parts and start examining that. And so what we've argued is that most aesthetic experiences can be viewed as, a, uh, as an emergent property of uh, large-scale distributed neural networks that have to do with how our sensory and motor systems operate, how our emotions uh, and uh, set of valuations operate, uh, and the way in which uh, meaning and our semantics, uh, our semantic understanding of the world uh, interfaces with that. 
And then depending on the context in which one is examining, whether it's uh, an aesthetic object or an artwork, uh, that uh, how those are weighted might vary depending on uh, the particular context. But at least this gives us a framework to start thinking about it. <coughs> so the talk uh, will, uh, just to kind of give you the landscape, I'll talk about beauty. Uh, it's hard to give a talk about aesthetics and not touch on beauty. Although I want to be clear that aesthetics is not isomorphic with beauty. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, what, uh, at least one version of what uh, Ernst Gombrich called the aesthetic gaze. Uh, talk about how might we think about aesthetic engagement, how might we think of this in neural terms. Uh, and then I will talk about a paradox uh, which uh, comes at least from the world I inhabit, which is uh, the clinical world of patients with uh, brain damage. Uh, and then some speculations about how we might think about the evolution of art. Uh, and those by their nature are speculations, but uh, I'd like to make the case that how people have typically thought about it probably doesn't make sense. Okay, so beauty. When we think about beauty, probably the prototypic object that most people feel comfortable saying is like beautiful or not beautiful are faces. And it turns out that we know a fair amount about both the psychological and neural processes of faces. Uh, and so this becomes a probe, a model with which one might start asking questions about what is the nature of beauty in faces. Uh, and most people have a kind of intuition, uh, and there tends to be a fairly broad agreement, although not complete agreement, fairly broad agreement on what kind of faces are beautiful, um, surveys, at least in the West, on the most beautiful face of the 20th century, for example. Uh, Audrey Hepburn shows up uh, high on the list. You might not agree with her as being the most beautiful face, but most people, I think, would probably agree that she's a, she's a beautiful face, had a beautiful face. Uh, so the question is, what kind of parameters? Are there parameters that one can identify uh, that seem to contribute to people's impressions that a face is beautiful? And it turns out that there are three systematic parameters that seem to show up across a variety of studies. The, the one that is uh, uh, talked a fair amount about is symmetry. And it turns out that if you have faces that are symmetric to a point, people tend to find uh, symmetric faces more attractive than faces that are not symmetric. And I say to a point because if you have the faces exactly symmetric in a way that never happens naturally, but you can do this uh, on a computer, you can do it digitally, uh, people get a little creeped out by that. So, so within the range of how normal faces are, uh, that the more symmetric people tend to find uh, these faces uh, more attractive, and this seems to occur independent of, of race, gender, uh, ethnicity, uh, and, uh, you know, um, and it, it seems to be a generalizable principle. There's an interesting uh, sort of historic background to this. Uh, this is uh, Maximilian Faktorowicz, who is a, a, a Polish immigrant, Polish Jewish immigrant to the US in the early part of the 20th century, who came up with the beauty micrometer. Uh, and he was sort of the, the uh, basically was the cosmetologist to the stars. And he, as you can imagine, from his name, he created the company called Max Factor. Uh, so it's a fortuitous uh, choice of names that his parents gave him, I suppose. Uh, but his idea was that if you, that you could, that there were these minor imperfections in people's faces uh, that, uh, that, that one might not be able to see easily but one could measure this using this kind of, uh, this kind of micrometer, uh, and then one could compensate for those flaws, and by compensate, he said, uh, make up for those flaws, and that's where the term make up comes from. Uh, and so this is a historic precedent for this idea that this kind of symmetry is important. So the second parameter also has a historic precedent that uh, precedes uh, Max Factor, uh, and this is this notion of averaging, which experimentally it turns out if you take a bunch of faces and average them, average them meaning that the average distance of the eyes, the average shape of the, uh, of the lips, the distance between the nose and the lips, 
uh, so on and so forth. Almost always that the face that is generated, that's the average of the individual faces that contributes to it, is more attractive than any of the individual faces. Uh, and this is something that was discovered quite by accident by uh, Francis Galton, who some of you may know, of the, was a polymath at the end of the 19th century. Uh, he was an anthropologist, a statistician. He uh, he had a lot of um, he had a lot of uh, things going for him. But he was also a eugenist at the time. And uh, and one of his ideas was that uh, if you could combine the faces of criminals, put them all together, and get the sort of prototype face, the physiognomy of a criminal, uh, that this would be useful information. And so instead of coming up with uh, Moriarty or Jack the Ripper, what he ended up finding was that the kind of face they came up with was more attractive than any of the individual faces. And then this uh, continued to be observed and has been replicated using modern methods uh, to make sure that you know, various conflicts that people thought might be going on um, uh, has, you know, has been shown not to be the case. Uh, and this turns out, again, to be a rather robust finding that averaging of faces uh, seems to uh, produce a face that is more attractive than others. And many people have an intuition about this, uh, which is we have the idea that often uh, children of uh, mixed race uh, parents often uh, are regarded as more attractive, and that you know children of families that are particularly inbred are sometimes not regarded as attractive. Uh, and so this is a kind of intuition that we have. Uh, and it's also one thing worth pointing out, which is the question always comes up is how much of this is universal and how much individual variability is there in this? And this is an example, I think, where you can have individual variability in the context of the process by which that variability is delivered itself is universal. So what do I mean by that? The implication of these kinds of experimental findings is that people encounter faces all the time and we are constantly developing our own prototypes that in the lab we might have this in a very constrained fashion. And so the idea is that we are developing our own prototypes based on the faces to which we are exposed and so that provides a vehicle by which one might have the variable about which faces uh, people find attractive, but the process by which one arrives at those uh, at those prototypes is something that is probably universal. And then the final uh, factor, uh, and this is all in the context of uh, heterosexual attractiveness, uh, is the effects of, uh, of what is sometimes referred to as heteros is referred to as sexual dimorphism. And this, these are the effects of both estrogen uh, on women's faces and testosterone. Uh, on men's faces and the kind of features that are associated with those. And typically, um, I think the story is a little more, more nuanced, but typically the kinds of faces uh, that show the greater effects of these kinds of hormonal influences are regarded as more attractive. So when you look at the, the kind of neural response to uh, attractive faces, uh, these were some studies that were done in the early, um, uh, in the early knots. And, uh, just to, um, you know, there's some particular areas that are important that we'll come back to. So this is parts of the medial orbor frontal cortex. So this is in the middle of the brain, right above the eyes. That's why it's orbofrontal, it's about, above the eyes. Uh, that seems to be an important area in which a lot of reward processing happens. Uh, and then there are some other structures. Uh, but the general point about showing this is that when people are in a scanner are looking at faces, that there is increased neural activity in certain parts of the brain that seems to be occurring systematically that, uh, that engages part of our visual system and parts of our reward systems. And so that's the, the general point I'd like to make. So we looked at this in a slightly different way, uh, and this was looking at faces that were computer generated where they could uh, be manipulated as being uh, closer or more distant from, uh, from other faces. And people came into uh, our lab, into the scanner, on two separate sessions. And in one session, they were making judgments of attractiveness. And in the other session, they were making judgments of identity. Right? So the second condition, they're saying, is this the face? Is, is the face the same as the face that they saw previously? And because we could manipulate the distance, the task wasn't always very easy. 
So, so that, that's the basic idea. And what we found was that when people are choosing, when they're making a decision about attractiveness, again, you get a, a, a range of different parts of the brain that are active. Uh, in the parts of the occipital cortex, uh, this is in the back of the brain on the undersurface, uh, it turns out that there is a certain degree of specialization of how information is processed there. So there is an area called the fusiform face area. There's an area that specializes, seems to be selectively sensitive to faces. Uh, there's another area that is more selectively sensitive to places. Uh, and an area adjacent that seems to be more uh, responsive just to objects in general as opposed to objects that are scrambled. Okay. So, what we find is that when people are making judgments of attractiveness, that these areas, particularly the fusiform face area and the adjacent areas, have increased neural activity to more attractive faces. And they also, in some other areas, uh, parts of the insula, parts of the frontal cortex, there are these various cortical areas that some have to do with attention, uh, are also activated when people are looking at more attractive faces. What was more interesting in some ways, because this sort of recapitulated what other people had, had found, what was more interesting is in the condition when people are making an identity judgment. Right? So all they're saying is, is this face the same as the previous face I saw or not? They're not asked if uh, the faces are attractive or not. What we find is that in this part of the central cortex here, uh, that neural activity continues to vary by how attractive the faces are. And one implication of this is that parts of our visual system, regardless of what the person is doing explicitly, is still responding to attractiveness uh, in these faces, uh, independent of what people uh, happen to be explicitly asked to do. The same idea was also replicated around uh, the same time. In this case, uh, this was not my lab, a different lab, looked at uh, a different kind of task, uh, which is instead of asking, is it the same face or different, people were asked to make uh, a width judgment, which of the two faces is wider. Right? So this is a purely perceptual task. And again, they found, now in reward systems, that there was both within the, this is a part called the ventral sphere, which is an important part of the brain for, um, for reward processing, and again, this uh, medial part of the orbifrontal cortex, uh, that they found that people had response in these reward areas even when they were making a judgment of how wide or narrow face was. And so you take both of these studies in combination, and one implication is that Regardless of what people are doing, there is part of our neural machinery that is responding to beauty in people, at least. And whether this generalizes to beauty in general, we just don't know. Those experiments have not really been done. So, uh, you know, while faces may be the prototypic kind of uh, object that we regard as beautiful, it's certainly not the only object. And so we did one study looking at architectural interior spaces. Uh, and uh, and we, you know, we varied uh, various parameters. It turned out, at least in our stimuli, that people tended to like curvilinear spaces more than rectilinear spaces. Uh, and this is an observation that others had made in a variety of ways. Uh, but for, for purposes of this talk, uh, again, we get this ventromedial prefrontal cortex activation for people's responses to places as well. Okay, again, suggesting that the same kind of reward system uh, or set of neural structures in the reward system are being activated by different forms uh, that one tends to think of as beautiful. And other people have looked at this with music. Uh, people have looked at uh, this in a variety of different ways. And you end up having the usual the usual suspects with respect to parts of the brain uh, of reward systems that tend to be active. And it's raised a kind of idea that people in, in this world talk about, which is, is there a common currency, is there a common currency of reward? Uh, the pleasure we get from beauty, and it doesn't matter what the vehicle for beauty is, but we get, we get the same kind of pleasure. So we, we wanted to ask that question in a slightly more nuanced way. 
uh, which is uh, that the, the, the studies up until that point had argued that if the same neural structures are activated, that that would suggest that there was a common currency. It turns out that in the last few years, there have been different kinds of analytic methods uh, that suggest that while that might be, that kind of neural signal might be necessary, it's not sufficient to make the argument. So what do I mean by that? One can have neural activity in the same part of the brain, but within that chunk of brain, one can have different patterns of activity that you can't tell just by looking at the overall activity. And the analogy I sometimes use is if you think of a house with a bunch of lights and from uh, some distance above, you're, you have a sensor that's telling you how much light is emanating from it. Right? You, can, that you can have the same amount of light emanating with different patterns of rooms that have lit rooms in there. Right? And, and, but if you're just looking at how much energy is emanating, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. And so there have been new analytic techniques that allow you to ask the question of, are, is there a different pattern of rooms lit up in the house or not, even though the overall activity is the same? Okay, so, so now the question is, within these same areas that seem to be activated consistently, is the pattern the same or not? And if the pattern is the same, we would say that's consistent with this common currency idea. Uh, versus not consistent with it. So that's the strategy. So we use places and faces. Uh, and uh, again, when we looked, we got these sort of similar areas, parts of the medial frontal, uh, uh, metromedial prefrontal cortex, orbital frontal cortex, and also lateral orbital frontal cortex. And basically what we found was that in the medial part of the orbital frontal cortex, using these analytic techniques, uh, we were not able to classify the faces from the places, suggesting it's the same rooms in the house that are being lit up. Right? So this suggests that at least in this part of the brain, uh, that there is no differentiation between the reward response to faces and places. Responds to beauty across different domains, and there seems to be some differentiation, at least in the context of looking at uh, faces and places. And again, I want to emphasize that this whole field is very, very early in its evolution, uh, and a lot of these things are being sort of worked out uh, as we go along right now. Okay, so now to move over, so, so we have some sense that these kinds of reward areas and, and visual areas seem to be involved uh, in, uh, uh, in, um, in uh, aesthetic experiences, particularly in the context of beauty. What do we make of this notion of aesthetic gaze? Uh, and here we're kind of stuck with Duchamp, right? which is this idea that, uh, that a certain kind of aesthetic experience happens uh, that can't be easily accounted for simply by the sensory properties of what you're looking at. Uh, and a lot of contemporary art has this kind of property. Uh, and the question is, how do, we, uh, how do we start thinking about this kind of phenomenon where there is a lot of top-down information that people bring to the table when people are engaged, in particular with art, but with other objects as well. Uh, and if you think about what we call the aesthetic triad, so far I hadn't talked very much about the top of that, which is sort of the system of meaning and knowledge that we have. Uh, and so here are some studies that start to address this. Uh, so this is a study that was done by a group in Copenhagen, and they also looked at architectural spaces uh, and faces. Uh, and in this case, the context, the top-down information, was based on people's education. And uh, what they did was they took architecture grad students and other grad students 
uh, and have them look at both uh, these kinds of faces uh, uh, and places. Uh, and the major finding was that architecture students, if you just looked at their behavioral uh, responses, that they tended to rate uh, they tended to rate buildings as more attractive than non-architectural students. Uh, but also, they had a different pattern of neural activity, which is that both kinds of both groups of students had responses to attractiveness of faces in exactly the same way. Right? In some ways, everybody is a face expert, but not everybody is a building expert. What the architecture students seem to have is a greater uh, degree of neural responsiveness, again, to these parts of uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex to the building. So they're looking at exactly the same thing that the other students are, but they're getting more of a, uh, at least a neural signal that suggests they're getting more pleasure out of it. Uh, and that they also found that in other parts of the brain, that seem to be in parts of, uh, this is the medial temporal cortex that we think has a lot to do with memory, that they're also drawing on, this, this is the inference they made, they're also drawing on their memories of, from their education uh, in their response to these images. Again, so the context here is their own education and expertise. They're having a different experience by looking at the exact same thing that is cached out in their brain, in parts of the brain that are important for memory, parts of the brain that are important for reward systems. Okay. Here's another kind of uh, experiment. Here, people weren't, there wasn't a group of experts versus another group. Uh, this is, uh, everybody was equally naive, but they show images where the content of the images are essentially matched. But one is presented in a way that people are inclined to think those are artworks. And again, what they find is that people uh, have a different neural response to the same image uh, in which uh, they think that these are our works as opposed to sort of flat images of the same content. And in the same kind of strategy, probably to me the, the more, the, the most um, sort of compelling uh, experiment is this one, which is, and this was again the Copenhagen group, uh, which is they took these kinds of abstract images and told people that the images were either generated by a computer using some kind of random generator, or that they were hanging in a fancy gallery in Copenhagen. Okay, exact same images is what they're looking at. Okay, when they are told that this is hanging in a gallery, people's ratings of how much they like it actually improves, gets better. But it's not just that, it's not that they're just sort of answering what they think they should be answering, but they, because they also end up having an increased neural response in these reward systems. So people are actually enjoying it more, we think, if they think it's from a gallery. Again, another kind of contextual effect on the experience of looking at exactly the same thing. All right, so we've talked about the engagement. And so what is this thing about engagement? What, what, how do we think about aesthetic engagement? And there, there are a few ideas that are worth uh, bringing up. Uh, one is our motor systems. When you talk about engagement, we think that our, we have a bodily engagement with it. Uh, this is an experiment we did in my lab, uh, which is uh, kind of using the strategy that in that one fMRI experiment I talked about where people are making judgments of, uh, of the width of faces. What we had is we had people uh, shown different faces uh, that varied on the width. And so two faces are shown on a screen. It's a mouse tracking experiment. So they've got, their, they've got a, uh, a mouse, and they just have to move the mouse to the face that they think is the wider two faces. That's all they're doing. Okay. What we also do in this is we manipulate which of the faces is more attractive. Right, so we do that separately, we norm up, norm up. Uh, And in some instances, the wider face is the more attractive one. And in some instances, the wider face is not the more attractive one. So what do we find? We find that when the target, it's an easy task, everybody can do it. Nobody has trouble moving the mouse to the face that is wider. What we find is that when the, the wider face is in fact the attractive one, people's trajectories move straight to it. On the other hand, when the wire face is the less attractive one, their limb it sort of drifts towards the more attractive face before it gets to the wire face. And this is, people are not aware of doing this. 
right? It's just sort of, it's as though, I mean, it's, it's as concrete as you can get about something being attractive. Like, attractive is not a metaphor here. It's sort of like the limb is actually moving towards it. Um, so that's one way in which it seems as though our bodies get engaged uh, with, uh, with beauty. Uh, here's a, uh, a, another clever one uh, that was done by an Italian group, uh, which is that people were, sh were uh, primed, motor primed, their motor system was primed by either holding on to a brush with a precision grip or this kind of force, <coughs> right? And, and they, so they do this sort of thing. And then they're shown paintings uh, in which uh, the paintings is either uh, using a precision grip, the way the paint is dabbed on it, uh, or this kind of force, uh, uh, sort of force strokes. And simply by being primed to hold their hold the brush in a certain kind of way, they end up finding that when they're primed with a precision grip, people tend to like these kinds of paintings more than the other kinds of and what they, they think is that there is a kind of motor resonance that's happening here, which is when they're looking at this, there is some apprehension of what went into the making of the, of the painting, and if their, their own motor system is primed uh, to do that, that they end up liking this uh, kind of painting more. And then finally, uh, this is uh, getting more directly at some mural work. Uh, and this is, uh, at least, there's this piece of information uh, you need to know, is that in our brains, we have various oscillation activities that you can detect using leads on the brain. And there's one particular one called a mu rhythm. And the only thing that you need to know about the mu rhythm is this is something that is sort of like your brain is on idle, right? Your car, when it's in park, right? And there's this kind of idle running. And as someone is about to make an action, make a movement, the mu rhythm suppresses. So it's like going from you know, park to drive. Something changes, and in the brain, this mu rhythm goes away. That's the observation that is generally well known. Uh, and what these folks find is that when people look at these cut canvases, uh, this, these are canvases uh, by Fontana, um, uh, as opposed to simply lines on a flat piece of paper, when they're looking at this, that these uh, that people have a suppression of this mu rhythm, right? and so what they're inferring from this is just by looking at this kind of artwork in which there is the implication of dashes, that people's own motor systems are prepared to act, uh, and that this is part of what it means to be engaged with these kinds of artworks. Um, and there's a whole backstory to this for those of you who pay attention to ideas around mirror neurons and embodied cognition. There's a kind of backstory to this that's not worth going, other than to say uh, this line of thinking is that, uh, that part of engagement with certain kinds of artworks is very, is very bodily engagement. It's about our motor systems. Okay. So, and there's another line of thinking, uh, which is goes back to the 18th century, to people like Kant and uh, the Earl of Shaftesbury, and this whole notion of disinterested interest. Right. So there is one idea that is promised, and by no means universally held, but this idea that part of aesthetic experiences is the kind of engagement and interest in which there isn't. Uh, it's not followed by a kind of utilitarian. Right? So I can look at a painting and be very engaged with it. I can also look at a painting and say, I would like to have that. Right? The second kind of valuation, which might give me pleasure, on this account is not considered an aesthetic experience. Right? But on the other hand, if I'm just sort of wowed by it, uh, that that would be an aesthetic experience. And, and at least the kind of terminology that Kant uses is it sort of frees the mind, uh, the free flow of imagination, Sure, I'm not getting it exactly right, but something along those lines. And so I'd like to take both of those ideas uh, and see what, what we can make of those uh, in terms of neural structures. And this leads to a kind of a, a set of very elegant experiments that a neuroscientist at uh, the University of Michigan has done, a guy named Ken Barrage, where he argues that our reward systems really have two distinct systems that work in constant. And colloquially, he refers to them as liking and wanting. 
and that they, the, and through a series of experiments, he's been able to show that the liking system and the wanting system have different neurochemical underpinnings. Okay, so the liking system is primarily driven by opioid and cannabinoid receptors. Right? Then you can think of the, the, the sort of exogenous use of the, the kinds of substances that tap into those receptors. As, as contrasted with the dopamine system, which is really about wanting. And so he argues that these two systems are differentiable and shows experimentally in rodents that this is actually true. Uh, and what we would like to say is that this starts to give some purchase to this idea of disinterested interest, which is that you can have liking without wanting, and you can have wanting without liking even though both typically go together. So the classic example of wanting where wanting is really boosted and liking is diminished, uh, has to do with, uh, with addiction. That as people have cravings, there's increased wanting, uh, but the same people don't get the same kind of pleasure out of that. And on this account, we would say that addiction is a, a prototypic anti-aesthetic experience. All right, so, and then the other piece around this, this is a study that was done by uh, Ed Bessel and uh, Gabriella Starr, who I understand might be speaking here later in the year, so I'm sure she'll go over this in much more detail. Uh, but this is a, an experiment in which they looked, people looked at different paintings, uh, and they were asked to reserve the rating, the highest rating of four, for the, the paintings that were especially moving. And what they found was that there was a different, qualitatively different kind of response when people made those ratings. And what was that response? Again, another little factoid that you need to know about the brain, which is that there is a part of the brain that is referred to as the default mode network. And this is a part of the brain that when people are given tasks to do, so typically when people are given tasks to do, parts of the brain that has increased activity. What is curious about this particular network is that when people are given tasks, neural activity goes down instead of goes up. In the last 10 years, there's been a lot of interest in what this is, what this means, what is going on, and the general idea is that this is a kind of, uh, uh, this is a kind of network that is involved in self-referential thinking and daydreaming, uh, where when you sort of let your mind go, and it's not so engaged in the external world, but this is the network that actually has something to do with that subjective experience that everybody in this room has had. So what, what these guys are saying is that in the setting of the most moving paintings, you get this paradox because this is a network that's not supposed to be activated by something in the external world, but it is in fact being activated by the paintings that people have the most profound moving experience. And so what they're saying is in those situations, the painting is forcing people to, to turn inward. Uh, and one version of this is that this could be the kind of free play of the imagination that Kant was talking about. That, that, that that's, that's what happens in these, uh, in these profound uh, experiences. I think I'm going to skip this one. All right, how many are going to time? All right. Is everybody hanging with me so far? Sometimes I tend to talk fast, uh, or at least too dense for, but okay, good. Okay, so because we're going to switch gears a little bit, right? So a lot of this is what's happening in the brain when people are looking at art. Now I'm going to switch to a slightly different topic, but we'll look back to why this is relevant, which is a, a, a paradox. Uh, that neurologists and you know my friend Jeff Saber is here, who's a neurologist, so he will he will make sure that I uh, get this right. Um, is that there is this 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 paradox that has been observed, which is in the setting of brain damage, sometimes people who are uh, will produce art that is more attractive or is better regarded, more highly regarded than their art before brain damage. And you think about this, it's, the, it's, it's this extraordinary, bizarre phenomenon because there is no other complex system in the brain, whether it has to do with perception, emotion, language, decision making, where one can make the claim that brain damage makes you better. Right? 
And I, I do want to sort of be very, very clear about this, which is the claim is not that if you want to be a better artist, you should go out and get yourself some brain damage. Right? The claim is that under some circumstances, this happens. It's not, it's not the norm, but some, some, under some circumstances, this happens. And what can we make of that as a phenomenon? Uh, and so I got interested in this, uh, but there have been several kinds of observations. So this is uh, a, an observation made in the late 90s by Bruce Miller. So there is a disorder called frontotemporal dementia. Uh, it is uh, a degenerative neurologic condition. It's not Alzheimer's disease, but it's in the same sort of category it occurs a little bit earlier. And in this condition, people, uh, in one version of this condition, people start to have changes in their personality. And one thing that Bruce works at, uh, at UCSF uh, started to observe that in some of these patients, they would start to produce these kind of striking representational uh, kinds of artworks. Uh, and these are people that had never painted before. But as the, as the onset of this degenerative condition, they start to produce this in a very kind of obsessive way. And so this is an example of the, 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 where a disease is actually predisposing people to produce these What's that? Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, but I, I'm like I'm, a, I'm the preface for everybody here. <laughs> Who else is talking? Maybe I can work them in. <laughs> um, so this is an example also that uh, is quite well known. Uh, is that there are a subset of people with autism who can have extraordinary drawing capacities, and this is uh, there's a whole monograph on this. Uh, child uh, named Nadia in the late 70s. This is an example of uh, a drawing she did when she was three years old. Uh, and this is a drawing she did when she was five and a half, and you can see she has perspective. Uh, it's really quite extraordinary. And just to put this in perspective, this is a typical drawing of uh, a six-year-old child. <laughs> so, now it turns out she was quite severely, uh, I mean, she was quite severely delayed. Uh, and the, the kind of the odd piece of the story is that later on, when she was around 10, uh, 9 or 10, her language system seemed to kick in, where she started to develop more of her verbal abilities in a, in a much more delayed fashion. And once that happened, her drawing became much more prosaic. Um, and so one sort of idea around this is that that was a, a kind of a, a, a marker that her semantic systems, her meaning system, was coming online, of which the language was, uh, was an epiphenomenon of that. Uh, and that this, uh, she was starting to become what more people are more typically like, which is we draw what we know rather than what we see. So she was starting to, to, uh, to adopt that kind of style. This is uh, among the pantheon of artists is probably the best known artist, William de Kooning, who had developed uh, Alzheimer's disease in the 1980s. Uh, and uh, during that time, he produced these kinds of artworks. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, they, they, they're a bit controversial, but from about 1980 uh, to about 87 or 88, he continued to produce artworks. And, Various critics think, particularly around the time between 84 and 86, that that, that that was the sort of peak of this period, late period, which is his Alzheimer's period. And the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art had a whole sort of retrospective of just this, this period of work. Uh, and some people think that he was really sort of paring down uh, the essential motifs that he had with his non-representational work uh, that he was doing in the 50s and 60s. Uh, this is someone who is uh, uh, a woman named Catherine Sherwood, who is an art professor at, in the UC system at Berkeley. And she is someone who, uh, uh, at the age of 44, when she was actually teaching a class, had a huge left hemisphere stroke. Uh, and uh, she had been an artist before, and she continued to uh, uh, paint afterwards. Uh, and her art artistic style changed considerably. Uh, and I bring her up because uh, uh, you know, we've done some work with her, but she herself has written a paper uh, in the Frontiers of Human Neuroscience as a first-person subjective account of what she thinks uh, happened to her and how her process of painting <coughs> came uh, following this. And if you look at her artwork, this is what she did before, this is what she did after uh, her, uh, her, her stroke. And so 
And this is just to give you a taste of these kinds of phenomena. I've written more about this. Uh, but the general point being that here we have a set of examples where in the context of neurologic disease, people are either predisposed to produce art in a way that they didn't, or there are changed, and in many instances, changed in a way that at least third uh, third party observers, often critics, tend to find their art more interesting. Okay, so that's the basic phenomenon of which there are many more examples, but this is just to give you a taste of that. And it raises a question of, uh, of what's the kind of model we should think about in the brain of how these systems are organized. And this is, to use this as a metaphor, are uh, two different ways to think about uh, things in the brain and what happens with brain damage. This is the more typical way, which is a house of cards. Right? You get brain damage, you move some cards, right? now you have a lesser structure, or if you remove it in some fundamental way, the whole thing collapses. Right? So you can have a stroke in the brainstem and people are left in a coma or they're locked in, so nothing happens. Um, but there's another way, I think, to think about some distributed cognitive abilities, and I think art production uh, and appreciation might be one of those, uh, where the better metaphor might be like a hanging mobile. And what that means is if you remove some of these weights, which would be the equivalent of the brain damage, it could happen in a certain way that the whole thing collapses. But it could also happen in a way where the whole system re-equilibrates into a different dynamic right, that, that itself has uh, a kind of functionality to it. And what I would like to argue that art production might be one of these broad-based systems where that happens, where you can have damage to certain parts of the brain, and the rest of the system equilibrates. And so what is produced is different but isn't necessarily lesser than what was being produced before. Okay? So the, the three points about this uh, that I'm going to come back to is that the idea is that it's a flexible set of uh, systems that's built on other subsystems uh, and socially modulated meaning a lot of art work right at this point is socially modulated. It's based on what people are exposed to and what the, what the conversation a particular artist is having. Uh, with other artists or with the uh, uh, with the or with their environment, but I just want to keep this idea in mind because that's relevant to the next part, uh, which is to ask this question about why do we have such a thing as art? What is what what's what are the evolutionary arguments uh, that people have used? Broadly, falls into two camps, and these are some fairly intellectual heavyweights that fall on one side or the other, which is on the one side you have people like Stephen Jay Gould and Stephen Pinker who think that art is kind of an epic phenomenon. That uh, uh, Pinker famously referred to it as cheesecake, he was talking about music but not this generalized to other artworks, that these are kind of epic phenomena of other things that have evolved uh, and that it's very hard to argue that there is some kind of instinct that produces art. On the other side are these folks. So Ellen Dasaniyaki has uh, written over the last 20 years a number of books arguing that art is instinct. Uh, Dennis Dutton is the late philosopher who, whose the title of his book was The Art Instinct, making very clear what his position is. Uh, this is uh, Jeffrey Miller. Uh, and, and they have a variety of arguments which I'm going to touch on. Um, and just to remind you that when we talk about evolution, it always boils down to this amazing little recipe that Darwin recognized, which is if you have any system that replicates, that has a certain amount of variation, and that there is some mechanism of selection on this variation, the whole system kicks into gear. Right? It, it's, it's one of these things that we've heard over and over, but if, when every time you stop and think about it, it's just extraordinary that, that this very simple format explains so much. Uh, I'm going to skip this. Okay, so the people who argue that art is an instinct make a variety of arguments, and this is one that uh, Ellen Kisaniyaki makes, which is that it's a kind of uh, evolutionary argument at the level of group selection, where she says that the whole act of making art 
and appreciating art is ritualistic that binds people together. And her arguments are more nuanced than that, but that's the nubbin of the argument. Um, and that this, is, this was advantageous for small groups in the Paleolithic that were bound together by these kinds of ritualistic behaviors that had, this had a selective advantage over time, and that that's really the function of what art is, is to make things special. Uh, and she has a way in which she ties this into the, uh, the relationship of the mother and child uh, to make this argument. Uh, other people have made a kind of costly signal argument. Uh, this actually can be traced back to uh, Darwin, who was concerned about the peacock's um, tail. And, and the basic argument there is that a certain kind of art production is advertising a person's fitness, uh, and that there are some biologic arguments around that. Uh, but those are the kinds of arguments people have made when it comes to uh, art potentially being an instinct. And this is predicated on the idea that it doesn't, however far back you go, there are certain kinds of artifacts that seem to be artistic. And it doesn't matter where in the world you look, there is a kind of decorative impulse uh, that people seem to have. And so it seems likely that there must be an instinct driving this. The people on the other side of this debate talk about the fact that art seems to be so culturally specific and so localized that it's hard to imagine how this could possibly represent an instinct. And, and that's the kind of argument that, that Pinker makes. Stephen Jay Gould basically says that, you know, most of what we know of art has happened in the last 10,000 years. It's not enough time for the brain to <coughs> evolve in new kind of instinct. So on first principles, it seems impossible. What I would like to argue is that we might be asking the wrong question. The question of whether art is an instinct or not might be the wrong question. And maybe the more fruitful question is, under what circumstances does art express an instinct, and under what circumstance does it not? So the question is not, is art an instinct, but when it's an instinct, what is the nature of art? And when it's not an instinct, what is the nature of art? And I will do this by analogy. <coughs> the analogy is a small bird. This is the Bengalese finch, is the hero of the story. Uh, and this is the white rump lunia. The white rump lunia is a feral bird that, that exists all over Southeast Asia. About 250 years ago, Japanese breeders decided to collect these, took them to Japan, and they started breeding them for the plumage. Rather than, uh, you know, so there was a certain kind of uh, visual aesthetic that they wanted to breed into these birds. Now, wh why is this relevant? These guys, in the wild, it's their song, the bird song, that is what predisposes them to, to mate. Uh, and that's their sort of artistic production on the adaptive sense, their song, uh, that is what makes them successful for future generations. In this artificial niche, where all that matters is the plumage, their song doesn't matter. The song at this point has no benefit for successive generations. And so this inherent drift that we have, so that we always have, this is how variation is introduced into our genetic stream, is that there is a constant drift that the, 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 the genetic control of the song of this bird is allowed to drift. And the question is, what happens to the song of this bird? And what happens is that the feral bird has a very, ste very stereotypic song. Right? But the Bengalese finch's song becomes more complicated. It becomes, uh, it has more structure to it. And importantly, it is socially modulated. That the Bengalese finch is able to learn new songs based on what is in its environment. So the songs sound very different. Uh, and this is over 200 generations of this bird, 250 years, 200 generations. Uh, and when people have mapped out sort of the songs, you can see the Bengali space is mapped out as to be far more complicated and structured uh, than, uh, than the feral bird. Another interesting thing that happens, it turns out that we know a lot about the neural organization of bird songs, that the, the, the feral bird that has its very stereotypic song 
most of that is, uh, is organized through what is the preferred equivalent of the basal ganglia, it's this kind of motor habitual system. Uh, but when you look at the Bengali sphinx, that you have a far more distributed cortical structure that is modulating how this uh, song is mediated. Okay. So, what I'd like to suggest is that the Bengali sphinx's song uh, is more cortically mediated, it's flexibly engaged, it is socially modulated, and that this as a description is more analogous to at least the way we experience art now in contemporary in our contemporary culture. Uh, and so to going back to my original point, I think it's at least worth thinking about whether this question of whether art is an instinct or not uh, might not be the right question, and the better question might be under conditions of high selection or under conditions of relaxed selection, what is the nature of art that is being produced? So, I'll end it there. Thanks.